before we get started, I just want to say a quote of Masters about meditation. And Paramahansa Yogananda says, to practice Kriya so deeply until you feel that breath becomes mind, that breath becomes an act of mind, it's a dream breath, and that with the power of mind you can take it or not take it. It's an interesting statement, and it obviously takes some time to practice Kriya Yoga before that becomes reality, but it's worth meditating on now. And now we get to the topic. This is a fun one. <clears throat> This is Martha and Mary, from week 19, The Secret of Right Action. Truth is one and eternal. Realize oneness with it in your deathless self within. The following commentary is based on the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda. One of the most famous stories in the Gospel is that of Martha and Mary. Jesus, visiting the home of Martha, was teaching while her sister Mary sat at his feet, absorbing his divine love and wisdom. Martha, meanwhile, busied herself with serving her guests, and was upset with Mary for not helping her. Lord, she cried, doesn't it matter to you that my sister has left me to do all this serving alone? Please ask her to help me. Martha, Martha, Jesus answered, thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. This story is classic, for Martha's complaint is very understandable, and not on the surface of it spiritually wrong. Jesus may well have told Mary to get up and help her. We don't really know that he didn't, consider it as he was of others' needs. But the teaching here doesn't concern the obvious dilemma of devotees, to work for God or to spend all one time, one's time in prayer. It concerns, rather, the attitude of the mind. Jesus didn't tell Martha, Martha, you are doing too much. He told her, rather, you are letting your work affect your inner peace. That was the contrast. Not work versus contemplation, but restless preoccupation versus peaceful absorption under all circumstances. As it says in the Bhagavad Gita, the second chapter, actions performed under the influence of desire are greatly inferior to those which are guided by wisdom. Happiness eludes people when they act from self-interest. Seek shelter, therefore, in the equanimity of wisdom. Thus, through Holy Scripture, God has spoken to mankind. At first, this reminds me of a story of Paramahansa Yogananda that he was cooking, and he had an assistant helping him. And as soon as he uh, finished using, let's say, a pot or a pan, she would immediately wash it. And then as soon as he was done with something else, she would immediately wash it. So he started just being as sloppy as he possibly could, using many more pans and pots that were needed, all kinds of other mixing bowls. And there she was just huffing and puffing more and more, trying to clean and clean and clean, until finally she just stopped and started laughing. He smiled at her, and then he stopped dirtying so many pans. And the teaching was that, yes, we do have to work in this world, but it's the attitude, as it said in this book. It's how we do that work. Remember these words always, actively calm, calmly active. That, that's the balance. And so the first way that we'll pick up this story is the contrast between contemplation or a life of meditation and a life of seva. And at the end, as I've said before, that the two need not be contradictory, that they can go hand in hand. But as we go on the path, we just say, sure, my teachers tell me, have a balanced life of service and meditation, and it seems fine to us, we do both. But then either one can easily get out of hand. The Meditation can get out of balance because we will find so much joy in it. We will find the greatest joy ever imaginable. And we'll begin to realize that God really wants nothing of us but our love. And it doesn't matter so much what we do outwardly. That we realize that this world goes on without us. And that soon enough we will not be in this physical body. 
that everything ends in dust. Even a little contemplation we see, whatever civilization we live in now, give it a few hundred years, a few thousand years, it won't be here anymore. But we, our consciousness, our soul, will still be here. And we realize that the point of all of this is to perfect ourselves inwardly, to perfect our consciousness. <laughs> and as that starts developing, we say, Seva, what's that all about? I want to be one of these yogis who meditates for 20 hours a day, like Ram Gopal Muzumdar. And we begin to realize even that if we can get quiet enough on the inside, that our thoughts really do have a great power. It's why we pray at the end of meditation. We want to send those peaceful thoughts. But those peaceful thoughts have a much greater power than outward activity. So all of this begins to dawn. And yet, spiritual pride can easily, easily develop if we just focus on meditation. And also, there are some karmas that we have on the inside that we are not yet ready to burn them up with Kriya Yoga. Kriya Yoga can burn them up on the inside, but sometimes we're, we don't just reach that point all of a sudden in meditation. And we do need to come back out, fulfill those karmas outwardly, make sure we're not developing spiritual pride, make sure we have an attitude that's willing to help anyone, even the most mean beggar that we see on the streets, because God is in that mean beggar too. And But these are just words that I'm saying. We have to have the attitude that proves it outwardly, that we have to be willing to go out and help that mean beggar if God asks us of that. So, bringing this all back to Martha and Mary, there's Mary sitting at the feet of Christ, and as we were just talking in meditation, she was taking that higher part of Christ, that she was sitting at his feet and opened her heart completely to him, and was absorbing with her every atom his consciousness through the lecture that he was giving. And her sister there was doing the other half of the equation, the seva, to feed all of the people that were there, to, to take care of the guests, and that it is an important part, and here Swamiji says we, we don't know that in some other part that Christ didn't tell Mary to get up and help as well, to do some seva. But the higher part of this is that Mary was receiving Christ's consciousness, that she was receiving that peaceful attitude that she, the, that, that she then could take into seva. Let me put it a different way. In Mumbai we were teaching last weekend, and we were talking about the Gita. And when the war begins, Duryodhana and Arjuna go to Krishna uh, for help in the battle. And Krishna says to Arjuna, I woke up and I saw you first. And also Arjuna was at his feet, a more humble place. Duryodhana was at his head. And so Krishna said, okay Arjuna, I'll give you the first choice. You can either have me or you can have my army. And Arjuna, of course, chose Krishna. And Krishna said, I won't even fight for you. I'll just guide you. And Duryodhana is so pleased. Oh my gosh, I get his entire army of all these millions. Stupid Arjuna. He's going to lose clearly here. But um, Arjuna knew that if he had the guru, if he had Krishna guiding him at every step along the way, then he'd, of course, win. And Mary was trying to open herself to this part of Christ that she could have him, whether she was sitting closely and listening, or whether she was acting. And another time Christ said, Me, you have not always. And when we have a true guru, we need to make sure that we sit quietly and open our hearts 100% and absorb these moments that stay in our consciousness for eternity and that nothing can take away from us. And then when we are in the battle den of activity, we can constantly cry, God, God, God. We can constantly bring those times of silent inward communion with our Guru back into our hearts and serve properly. So this um, struggle that the devotee may have between seva and meditation, it's by no means a little one. It's a huge part of the Bhagavad Gita. And Krishna, I'm sorry, Arjuna asked Krishna more than one time, I'm still confused, please say it to me again. And Krishna even in that Gita says that it's okay, even the wise become confused upon these points, whether just to sit without action and just meditate, or whether to act. 
And so another side of it that I didn't bring up that I want to bring up is it's also easy to get confused just in Seva because we begin to realize that God's doing absolutely everything. So he's doing all of this Seva through me and I'm thinking of him the whole time that I'm serving. This must be enough. But it's not enough. It's we have to make sure that we can go within also and go deeper and deeper in meditation, that we can begin to see the spiritual way as it is, that we can begin to hear Om as it is, and even that's not enough. That we have to merge ourselves into Om, we have to merge ourselves into that light, and that we can't do in Seva. That once one becomes very advanced, then he can see the spiritual eye even in activity. But before that, he has to do both. You know, it's so easy for discrimination to get mixed up on the spiritual path. For example, I've met many people who say, well, I'm just going to have one drink of alcohol. It's all right. God's doing everything anyways. He's the one doing this through me. I'm just going to take a little bit of his money adarmically or whatever your tendency may happen to be. But it's all right. God's the doer. That is a wrong use of discrimination. And we can't use our discrimination wrongly and hope to get there. And I want to go through this as it is, as our consciousness climbs the inward tree of self-realization. So Master spoke about Moon, the thousand petal lotus, Bodhi, which is here in the spiritual eye, Ahankar, which is here at the medulla, our ego, and Chitta. Discrimination, we're talking about all this because of having right discrimination. Discrimination lives here. And before we'll go into the fall, and then we'll go into climbing back out. So the fall is that in the thousand petal lotus, it is all one. Yes, you are that drink of alcohol that you're drinking. Um, and when you live here, fine, a master can eat hot nails and think nothing of it. But if you try to drink alcohol or eat meat before you're a master, before your consciousness is 100% centered here, it will lower your consciousness. You will fall even more. So that's the difference between moan and buddhi, discrimination. Discrimination, it divides up and chops up and says, uh, that's a horse and that's a tree. And a horse and a tree are different. And now, but in order to have that right use of discrimination, um, our energy has to come up. We cannot have a distorted chitta and our ego has to be purified and refined. And if our ego, if we're caught too much in ego and it's not refined, we'll use discrimination to justify our ego and say, well, of course I should be able to do this. And the example that Master gave, that when we see that horse, the ego automatically says, ah, oh, that's my, it's not your horse, no, get your hands off it, not yours either, that's my horse. And already then discrimination has become clouded by the ego. And then finally as our energy consciousness drops here into chitta, that um, chitta is feeling. And when the feelings are distorted, that we say, oh, how happy I am to see my horse. And the moment our horse dies or someone takes the horse away, oh, how sad I am to see my horse. And when our emotions are fluctuating like this due to uh, the disturbance of chitta, there's no way we can have accurate discrimination. And so the first, so now that's how we fell, now how do we climb back up? The first thing that every devotee needs to do is gain control over our heart. With Kriya Yoga, breath becomes mind. That with Kriya Yoga, we learn how to make our breath very, very still. That's this chakra, the heart and the lungs, becoming very still so that we can learn to refine our ego ego, and so that we can learn to discriminate properly. Um, this is a very important point. Uh, again, in this lecture in Mumbai, I was talking about uh, uh, Bhima, who personifies the heart chakra. And Bhima is known to eat lots of things, that he does personify desire. But desire, when the energy is flowing down and out into the five senses, desire wants all these things and we get so confused. But when we have the proper desire, that means to say there's one desire that's proper, that's divine love, that's devotion. When the current's running back up towards God, when every all of our entire being, when we're going back in this direction, then we're going in the right way. 
Um, Swamiji put it so beautifully in one of his songs. He said that when uh, love is confused for desire, I got that a little wrong, but um, that's the whole trick really of Maya, that when for love desires are mistaken, that's the exact quote from that song. And it's so easy to get love mistaken for desires. And so we want to purify ourselves. We want to purify ourselves of all desire so that we can learn to express and feel the one pure love for God. And that love is so beautiful. There's, Master put it, that once you eat good cheese, you no longer want stale cheese. The path, it doesn't become so much of a battle anymore once you start tasting God's love. And you only want that. And it becomes much more easier. So just keep going is the point there. Anyway, so uh, we have to climb back out by calming our heart, raising our energy up, get back to having a purified ego that really begins to become king of the infinite, like the chant we had earlier this evening, and learns how to command our entire body, and we become a master of ourselves. There's a quote in the Christian, Christian Bible that says, He is more mighty who learns how to rule himself than who takes a city. So this is what we want to learn how to rule, and that's the proper use of ego, learning to rule ourselves. And we offer ego back to Krishna who lives here, and then he's the proper use of discrimination. And once we've offered every action of ours back to God, once we want God to guide us, then Krishna shows us how to pierce through here, and we become one with everything at the thousand petal lotus. I just want to emphasize that point one more time. Yes. It's difficult to think in every moment, okay, God, what do you want? And it's hard for us to hear God's response, and so we forget to have this inner communication with Him. But even if we can't hear His response, offer it up to Him anyways. Ask God constantly, what do you want me to do in this situation? He will come to you. He knows you can't hear Him 100% perfectly. He'll find other ways for you to explain to you what to do. But you at least have to want to have that relationship with Him. You have to want to do His will. If you have that, it will grow and it will become more beautiful. Now, the second part of this uh, Mary and Martha story. So we talked about the conflict between uh, seva and meditation and how hopefully it doesn't have to become a conflict. But the other thing that I want to bring up now is a personal and impersonal relationship with the Guru. It's a fascinating thing. I once was criticized by someone whose wisdom I do have a high respect for, and she told me that I should have had a more personal relationship with Swami Kriyananda when he was in the body. And because I have a high respect for this person, I have, I'm still contemplating those words to this day, but when I was with Swami Kriyananda, I literally just felt like I was with God. It was very difficult for me to, you know, elbow him in the ribs and say, hey there, buddy, <laughs> what should we do today? That I just felt like I was with God. I just, I wanted to get my harm, heart as calm as possible. I wanted to get my mind as calm as possible. I wanted to receive his consciousness in the quiet of my own soul, the way that Mary was receiving this consciousness. And to me, that seemed to be the most important thing. You know, Paramahansa Yoganandaji's most advanced disciple, Raju C. Janakananda, that Master would show him a lot of outward love. And he said that he couldn't show other disciples that amount of outward love because they weren't developed enough spiritually and that they would take it personally and think, oh great, now I have this outer relationship with the Guru. But, you know, that person that told me I could have had a more personal relationship with Swamiji, sometimes I don't know. But I'm happy with what I took inwardly. And I don't know that I was developed enough to have it an outer relationship as well. And to me that inner relationship meant everything. Now, does this mean, and this goes back to also developing ourselves stepwise, that we have to put this puzzle together in the right order. And so most people have personal relationships with their family, with their co-workers, and it's a right thing. Monks 
in general are thought of having impersonal relationships with everybody. But I know monks, I've seen monks who try to just have that impersonal thing and think, well, I'm not, you know, I don't have to worry about anything. I don't have to take responsibility for anyone, anything. I don't have to care about what anybody thinks about me, just cold and impersonal. I only love a God in you, now go home. And this doesn't work. That I, this quote, I can't remember at all, so I'm not even sure I should attribute it to Master the way I'm going to bundle it up here, but basically he said that if you can't love God in your fellow man, then you can't love God in his infinite form. So we have to start with personal love. That We have to start with loving God in people. We have to start with loving God in our family and in some personal relationships. And slowly, as we develop spiritually, that does turn into a love for God and God alone. When we contemplate just a little bit of all the lives we've lived, all the mothers and fathers that we've had, and of course in this life, we love our mother and our father so dearly, and it's right. But when you really think about it, it's God through those forms. But that doesn't mean that you need to be cold towards your mother and father in this incarnation. And so that's something we have to learn really to find this balance of personal and impersonal love. And then we have to learn to make that personal love, we transmute it into an impersonal love that's for God alone. But it's not a cold thing, it's a very warm thing. That when I was in the presence of Swami Kriyananda, that even in a big group, if we weren't talking, his love, it was so amazing that it felt so much more wonderful than the personal love that most people give each other. And so, this story of Mary and Martha, that it personifies also, one, how we need to approach the Guru, and how we need to take his personal love and transmute that into impersonal love and see him as just God there. How we need to have personal love for the Guru, but then transmute that into impersonal love for God. And then, in the highest sense, we want to have that relationship that Rajasi and Janakananda had, or sorry, Rajasi and Master had, where they could even still share the sweetness of a little bit of personal love, of giving each other presents and holding each other's hands. And so it becomes so beautiful. And another way of looking at it is that it doesn't just end in this impersonal cold thing, it ends in both personal and impersonal. Isn't that an interesting thing? It's something for those who call themselves Gyan Yogis to think about. That God is both personal and impersonal love. And you can know if you're doing the right balance, if you're approaching your guru correctly, if you're approaching your loved ones correctly, by your heart. That if your heart drops, if someone goes away on vacation, and even though they're coming back in a month, you should, oh, so sad, they're going away forever then you might know that your love is a little bit too personal. And But if you think, I don't care if I ever see them again, whatever, then your love might be a little bit too much impersonal. But whatever, however you go about this, I want you to make sure that you take the time on the spiritual path to cultivate love. That devotion, love for God, it has to be cultivated. That it's not something that you can just hope works out on its own, it won't. You have to become very sensitive to the feelings in the heart, become very sensitive to energy in the heart, and a very particular sensation feels there that feels good. And that's all that we've all been looking for anyways throughout all these incarnations, is how to feel good. And this is the first step, that divine love, learning how to have that true love, that true good feeling. And these are sensitive things, and they're subtle, but they're the basis of all life. That the saints of all religions say that God is love. And we have to feel that. First we intellectually try to understand that. But then we have to feel how is it that love itself permeates and sustains, uplifts this entire creation. How did God build this creation from love? That you have to go within. You have to feel that within yourself. Um, Another thing that I wanted to bring up here in this personal and impersonal relationship with God and the Guru is that it said that if you take a candle that's in a dia, let's say, um, or whatever, some little small bowl, um, that right around that candle will be a dark shadow 
um, that's made by the bowl. But then a little further out, of course, is a lot of light that that candle gives. And it's the same way as you approach a guru, that when you're very, very close to him, that you cannot see that he's giving so much light to the whole world. And there is a danger in having too personal a relationship with the guru, where if you spend a lot of time with the guru in a personal way, you begin to see little habits, you know, whatever. He likes apples, he doesn't like bananas, or whatever the case may be. And it's so easy in that state to forget that that's God in there. And that really he doesn't care one iota about bananas or apples. He just cares about love, peace, joy, and sending that out to all that will receive it. Um, so again, that's another danger that happens. And I, I've seen a lot of people, people would, this I haven't seen in this incarnation, but people would say that Master, oh yes, I met him. He's such a wonderful cook. And that's all they could see. One, that can happen if you get too close, as we're saying. But another way that happens is if you're not able to see. And Jesus would often say, for those who have ears to hear, let them hear. He would speak in parables, but his close disciples would understand the deeper nature of what he was saying. And so Mary, in this case, took the better half. That she didn't just see the outward nature of Christ, of what a wonderful person he was, what a wonderful cook he was, or whatever. She saw that there was something back there much, much more. And I'm going to end by reminding you, this world makes it easy for us to forget, but remind you that behind your persona, behind your ego, behind all of your likes and dislikes, is something so much more, something so great, so grand, so vast, that it's so hard for us to even believe that God is right there within us, dwelling within us. But if we can just get behind our thoughts, if we can calm our mind down, calm our restless emotions and desires down, just behind our little restless thoughts, there God is. And then we can begin to communicate with Him in a language that goes beyond words, in a language that goes beyond thoughts. But we have to have that wistful yearning, that even we have to keep wanting Him in that language that goes beyond thoughts. And if you cultivate that desire, if you want God deeply enough, remember, all desires must be fulfilled. He will come. He will come. I want to tell you one final thing. Swami Kriyananda one time said, I have a desire to help everybody find God. And every desire must be fulfilled. And you too, when that... <laughs> Uh, trouble between seva and meditation is over and in your meditations you realize who you truly are in your seva you too will want to actually give God to every human being and your deep meditations will show you how that can be possible and you will experience so much joy in that realization God bless you and I look forward to seeing you again next week